feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank. Welcome back to another episode of The Shrimp Tank. We are coming to you virtually from Seattle and beyond as we include both the Bay Area and the Great White North Canada. Listen, if you want to learn how to start, grow, or run a successful business, this right here is the podcast of record. It's a podcast for you. This is where street smarts and book smarts collide. Hello, I'm Dan Whedon, and today we have our special five on five. That's every fifth week, every fifth Wednesday of a month, we gather all five co-hosts together. Today we have a very special show. We're going to be talking about, hey, we're either growing or dying. What's the case for you? As we head into the end of 2021 and into 2022, we're going to talk about some things that you should be uh, strategically thinking about. So uh, buckle up, enjoy the ride. James Alberson is going to be our host for today. More on that in a minute. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts. That's iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher, YouTube. I should make us all say together, we are ubiquitous. We come to you from about a dozen cities, including Atlanta, Boston, Boca Raton, whole bunch of cities. Uh, I think we're the best, but nobody else will hear that. Uh, Again, today, I am good joined by my co-host, Linda Popke, Phil Simchich. Michelle Baumberger, and again, today's host with the most, James Alberson. James, the show is now yours, pal. Bring it all right. on. All righty, I'll take the stick here. Well, uh, glad to be uh, hosting today uh, on this our five on five series. Welcome to uh, Dan and Phil and Linda and Michelle. Uh, we're gonna really just have some fun today, uh, hopefully, have some thought provoking conversation so somebody can uh, or everybody can take at least one thing away to uh, to ponder if you will so i have some group questions that we'll kind of throw out to the group but then also have some individual questions for each person to uh, show your expertise and just how how smart you really are out there so uh let's start with a group question uh let me let me look at my my list here i have to I, I have about 50. Let me pick one. Um, actually, you know, let's let's talk about uh, the the coming of the past shows we've had guests on, and uh, every guest really throws out a lot of good uh, knowledge, little tidbits, and things like that. I'm curious uh, for each of you when you think about the shows that you've been the the co-host for, and, and Dan, you're always here. You're ubiquitous, right? Um, what's one thing when you think about it that uh, you've t- taken away from any of the uh, any of the shows that you've uh, co-hosted or even listened to that you're able to you've been able to implement in the way you do things or that you're thinking about doing so. Uh, let, let's start with uh, let's start with Michelle. Yeah, thanks. What a great question. Um, you know, I don't know if this is because it's the most recent, but it certainly was one of the most powerful ones that I've I've listened to, and we had Bria Starmer on last week. And she really is so mission driven and how mission plays across the entire organization, not just some of the the messaging that we put out to the public, but really around her people and the difference that she wants to make in the world. And it's really got me thinking about our business model, the difference that we're trying to make in the world and how do we really push that out into all parts of our business um, so the messaging is really clear and the why is really visible. Okay, that sounds good. Let's uh, let's jump over to Phil. Uh, sure. So it's kind of a combination of two things. When we had Gary Fur on a, a um, couple months ago, he talked about the basic business fundamentals, and when people uh, lose track of the fundamentals, sometimes due to success and complacency, uh, or they don't have them all in the first place, it it you just can't grow and and then john hine on our last session who's um, shoemaker manufacturing in uh, cleelum he runs with the fundamental fundamentals and with his entire executive team so they've got more than 100 employees and so he he can't do it all co-owner can't do it all so they're relying on an, an executive team so they're demonstrating how they've used those fundamentals to to grow and and that's just a 
a good reminder for me and my professional work too. We need that foundation. We always need that foundation. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Uh, Linda, what about you? So I'm new, so I haven't done very many of these, but I've- I gave you plenty of time to think about it though. So yeah, <laughs> you done. did, thanks for not putting me first. <laughs> but I did have a great conversation with Nick Johnson on the first Wednesday of the month, September 1st. And what struck me about Nick and some of the other sessions that I've listened in on is how an individual, a small business person can find a hole in the market and create a service that wasn't there before that's much needed. So Nick basically said, you know, um, there, we need to have a way to help independent bookstores get into the audiobook business. It shouldn't all go to Audible and Amazon. How can I make that happen? And how can I provide a service to authors and to readers or listeners, I guess? And I think that's true of just about all the, all the uh, guests is that they find a, a place that something has to happen and they make it happen. You know, necessity is the, is the mother of invention, right? That's, that's yeah. what they say. I think that's how it goes. Uh, and, and I think that's you know, probably 90% of entrepreneurs start off that way. And all of a sudden they have a, a multi-million dollar business. So fantastic. Uh, uh, Dan, you know, you've been around for all of the shows, so uh, this should be easy for you to pick. Uh, or maybe it's like the maybe it's like the uh, cheesecake factory menu. So there's there's too much stuff. And so it's really hard to pick one. A lot of, lot of cheesecake. <laughs> well, you know, I have two. I have two because, you know, and it's interesting. Uh, the word pivot uh, seems to have been ubiquitous lately. However, I was a basketball coach for a lot of years and, and pivoting was an important part of the game. And there's two guests that I think of that really discussed and exemplified pivot. Number one, you know, Jordan Bab Babineau wrote a book, Pivot to Win. And he talked about how change and pivoting from, from different areas of his life and how he, he started out in a, in a division two college, uh, found his way onto the NFL as a free agent, created a nine year career in the NFL, and then had to continue to pivot into the broadcast booth and, and, and all of that. I found that fascinating. Uh, but Annie Chang, not Bud, but include, and then Annie Chang, uh, Michelle Bomberger uh, brought Annie in. And I thought that was fantastic where she had in March of 2020, a thriving business that you traveled. It was a travel business. And she was traveling to Europe and to South America and to eight, all over the place. And then all of a sudden had to shut down and found a way to basically bring the world to people virtually. And not only you know that, but now she's able to do that forever, and and it's and it's grown and blossomed. So, uh, you know, I was thinking about the ability of entrepreneurs to pivot quickly, decisively, uh, in an effort to sometimes merely survive, but then thrive out of it. Nice, two good examples. I'll go ahead and play uh, what comes to mind immediately for me. I think because we deal with it every day is uh, Shelly Golden and her uh, show on Zoom makeovers and things like that. You know, when I, every time I, I get on Zoom or, or with, I'm in, if I'm with a group or even individually, I, I tend to notice more the backgrounds that uh, people have and the settings. And sometimes I say, wow, that's impressive. Or sometimes I think, man, I need to send them over to Shelly. Uh, <laughs> so, and since it's really gonna stay with us for the foreseeable future in some, on some level, uh, that, that always kind of sticks with me. And it leads me to the next question, really, when, when I talk about or when I, I mentioned stay with this, obviously, we're, we're slowly matriculate, matriculating to some other sense of normalcy. But uh, when you think about going into 2022, man, it seems strange to say that. Uh, the, the question to the group, how do you think uh, 2022 is going to be uh, more difficult or less difficult than 2021. I'm curious when you think about, you know, how, how would you actually kind of answer that when it comes to what the scene is going to look like on the, in the workplace or virtually? What are your thoughts on that difficulty transition from 2021 to 2022? Uh, let's, let's start with Linda this time. You know what, I, that's a great question, um, James. And I think it's going to be yes, better and yes, worse in certain ways. One of the things about 2021 is we didn't have a choice. You know, everything shut down and we had to do what we had to do. Now we have questions. Do we have vaccine mandates? Do we have people tested? Do we work at home? Do we have hybrid? 
Do we go to events? All these things are, are kind of evolving, which I think make it harder for uh, business people to figure out how to run your business. Uh, on the other hand, I think there's a lot of opportunities because there's a new world out there. And just like there was um, no one, no one knew about making masks a year and a half ago or holding weddings or funerals on Zoom or live stream. I think there are going to be other opportunities for entrepreneurial people to say, as we move through this different phase, there are things that you can start to do and you can start to build a business around. And those businesses that are stay close to their customers will do well, regardless of all these, this other stuff going on, because they will maintain and see this clear path and do what the right thing is to make their business and their customers happy. Sounds good. Michelle, what about you? Yeah, I think what will be challenging going into 2022 is thinking about what are the growth drivers of the business and what are the limitations? So one of the things that's been I think notable is, you know, we're all aware of the pandemic, we're all aware of the shutdown. And then you find out that containers coming out of China are five times the cost that they were two years ago. And you can't get cars because you can't get chips. And employment is in this sort of weird upside down world right now. So I think there's still a lot of uncertainty around when that's going to resolve itself. And so when you're thinking about growth as a business, understanding what are those, those variables and how do you reconcile them for your particular business so that you can move forward confidently. Makes sense, makes sense. Phil, your thoughts. Well, we've been going through this for about a year and a half. So we're all carrying a certain amount of COVID fatigue. And applying Darwin, those of us that adapt and deal with the, the funk and, and get through it and realize, okay, this is new reality. I can control some things. I can't control some others. That mindset will really help people to be successful uh, regardless of what the future brings. And it's also creating a lot of separation of the, the vaccinated and the unvaccinated as to who has privileges in what environment. And hopefully that gap will shrink so that we can carry on, but there will definitely be distinctions in how we do business and, and with whom. And so positioning your business to be able to function and deal with customers literally in, in both camps, um, perhaps remotely, perhaps in person, is going to be key to, to carrying on and being successful. Yeah, I agree. And maybe they, every business might need to hire a bouncer to break up fights that uh, that might uh, break out when people come back live. I don't know. I certainly think restaurants should do that. Uh, Dan, why don't you finish this off with your thoughts? I wish you would have had me before Phil because I was going to talk about mindset. Now I got to pivot. I'm going to have to pivot. Up. But you know what? I'm going to pivot from that. And I think this is where leadership is going to be uh, evident, uh, either good leadership or lack of leadership. Because uh, as everybody's just said, uncertainty is still out there. It always was before, but it, it seems to be even more volatile now. And how a CEO or a business leader or an executive role models and communicates to their employees is going to be critical. Uh, when things uh, don't look so good, uh, there, there needs to be encouragement. There needs to be positivity. Uh, there, there can't, it, you can't let the, the, the bad stuff sift into the employees and, and, and into even to your supply chain vendor partners. Uh, and when they're good, you have to kind of put your foot down on, on, and make hay while, while it's there. So I really think it's all about mindset, attitude, and the ability to lead and manage personalities within your, uh, within your company to make sure that everybody's still rowing as a team. Rowing in the same direction. Yeah. I was just thought of Michelle Ber Bomberger on rowing, but rowing in the same direction uh, together. Yeah, you know, you bring up a good point and something I think a lot of uh, company leaders are going to have to think about, and that is it shines a light on your company culture. And, and how you're going to maintain, if you have, if you actually, if you have established a strong company culture and, and how that culture will actually either uh, um, supersede the individual, different individual uh, opinions and, and that sort of thing, or if it'll just crumble, you know, how strong is it and how do you actually pivot even when you, it, with your culture to keep, the, keep people going in the same direction and that sort of thing. 
you know, I'm going to go to an individual, some individual questions now, because it, it kind of leads to one that I have for Michelle being in the legal profession. And that is, let me make sure I phrase this correctly here. Um, when you think about, not that the phrasing is important, uh, but when you think about the vaccine mandates and that sort of thing, you know, are, do you think employees are facing an uphill uh, battle uh, due to vaccinations, obviously, when you think about what's what's legal, what's challenged, and that sort of thing, what 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 are your thoughts on that? Give us some some expert advice or, or opinion. I'm going to start with the "it depends" answer, which is the typical. You know, That's approach, not fair. So we're, we're going to caveat this with this is not legal advice, um, but you know, I think it's it's clear that businesses can choose to enforce. A mandate. They can put that in place. That's that seems very very clear at this stage. I think where the challenges come in is how it's communicated and who your employee base is. Um, you know, I think a lot of us are surprised that you know, and maybe we shouldn't be, that you're seeing a lot of folks in the healthcare profession who are challenging this and objecting to this, um, in part because they look at the world a little differently. Um, you know, the way that they look at, you know, medicine may be from a different standpoint than the, the mainstream media and how we're kind of pushing vaccines out there. Mm -hmm. So to me, you know, the, the legality of it is, is certain, but again, I feel like that's maybe not the moving part, at least at this stage. Um, the bigger piece is how are we communicating this and how are we then flexing to the extent we can flex with um, our employees which gets into you know, the, the exemptions for religion, exemptions for disability and, and for the flexibility that needs to be provided there. Mm -hmm. And answering those questions, a lot of employers are really struggling with what is a religious exemption? Do I need to accept it? And should I be digging around and asking? Which again, opens up a whole nother can of worms. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I'm, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. I'm gonna go over to Linda. I mean, just with, with so many things going on, uh, in the world, it's, it's really, it's a noisy world right now, you know, politically, socially, medically, and that sort of thing. You know, your expertise is, is uh, how do I want to say it, maybe marketing above the noise and that yeah. sort of thing. So my question to you is, uh, you know, given all this, fourth quarter of 2021, right around the corner, uh, going into 2022, you know, how can businesses stand out above all of the noise, if you will? Well, that's a great question, James. And it certainly has gotten, if, if anything, more noisy, even though I thought, you know, 2020 was noisy with the election and some other things going on. And then we hit 2021 and things continue to, to be noisy. So how do you stand out? I think you stand out by not engaging in um, the same behavior that everyone else is doing, but trying to find your niche, trying to find a way to, um, to figure out what your customers need where your business can add value, and then focusing very clearly there. Uh, making sure that your employees are happy too, because you cannot have happy customers and unhappy employees. So you need to make sure that whatever message you're getting out there is carried through through the people who are working with your customers. Um, and being very, very clear that um, that you may need to, to pivot, as, as Dan says. You may need to do things differently. Um, and being the first one on the block to try something different, don't wait for everybody else to catch up. Don't wait for normal to come back because we don't know what normal is or if it's ever coming back. So get out there and get outside your, your comfort zone and pop your head up and say, where can I go and, and try things? And if they don't work, try something else. Yeah, absolutely. You know, in, in my business, as we uh, train sales teams and, and salespeople, we have a saying on the rule that says, if your competitor is doing it, stop doing it right away. Exactly. Uh, otherwise, you're just lost in the crowd. How are you distinguishing yourself? So that's a very good point, uh, in, I think, in all of life. Uh, one, one way that we, we cannot be different than uh, our uh, other podcasts and that sort of thing is we still have to pay the bills. We still actually have to have a commercial break here and there. And, you know, time flies. It's come for us to... Uh, take a quick break with um, and, and acknowledge our sponsors. I'll throw it over to Dan for that. So I'm going to play producer here. I'll acknowledge our sponsors quickly. And then I we, we'll obviously want to hear from Phil and, and kind of finish off those questions because uh, these, these, this is a lot of fun. 
So mm -hmm. I want to first of all thank the people here that you're seeing. These are our title sponsors. Uh, and I'm going to call them out as I see them. James Alberson, Sandler Training Seattle, sales experts. Uh, talk to James if you if you want to up your game in sales. If you, up, you want to up your game in uh, wealth building and value building of your business, Phil Simchich, an SME wealth builder. It's the name says it all. Uh, you need to call Phil. Uh, we just talked about marketing and, and being heard above the noise. Linda Popke and Leverage to Marketing Associates. Uh, she's the one to do that. And of course, for anything related to legal, and she gives you real legal advice when you talk to her in person uh, at Equinox Business Law Group, Michelle Bomberger, thanks to all of you. We also have some great corporate sponsors. We have Cornerstone Financial Strategies, Ideal Life 360, the Kitsap Sun Newspaper Group, and uh, First Underwriters Insurance. So thank you to all of our corporate sponsors and of course our title sponsors, James, back to you. All right. Well, welcome back. Of course, we didn't go anywhere, but uh, we'll act like we did. Uh, before we go to our segment, hot or not, because I have some good juicy questions, I want to actually still give an individual question to to Phil. You know, given that you know a lot of businesses just didn't quite make it uh, through uh, 2020, some are still hanging on, just hanging on 2021. You know, what would be your advice to those? Uh, going into the to the fourth quarter and into 2022, uh, as far as you know, what they need to be thinking uh, of doing that will, um, or, or well, how do I want to ask that? Uh, what what they need to do to to survive going into 2022? What do they need to do in the fourth quarter to set themselves up? From your opinion. Well, most of us have probably had the experience when the computer's not working and we call support. The first thing they tell us to do is unplug it and reboot it. And so any business that is struggling right now needs to definitely reboot and look at what's working and what's not working, cut out what's not working and make some tough decisions, right? Because otherwise the, the future will not get better. It's the status quo is, is not an option in business. And, and so we have to be as proactive as we can over what we can control. We have to look as, as Linda said for new niches and as Michelle said, we have to be aware of uh, where our costs are going up, where we're losing competitiveness, and where are the opportunities to gain competitiveness, and then focus on our people, both customers and employees, to make sure we can provide value all along the way. So don't just sit there and, and hope the ship doesn't sink, because um, that's not going to work. And, and so you, you've got to figure out and, and try something new and, and, and fail fast and, and measure results and keep adjusting, but keep your feet moving. Very true. As we say in our business, hope is not a strategy. So uh, good, good answer there. Hey, we're going to shift over to our hot or not segment. I have uh, something good for each individual. Dan, we haven't heard from you in a while other than that great commercial break. Um, you're in the insurance business, you know, the world in many cases is about convenience and having things at the tip of your fingers and all that. So hot or not, purchasing insurance off of the internet. <laughs> well, well, I think, uh, I, I think purchasing groceries off the internet uh, works just fine, but per, you know, purchasing insurance off the internet, uh, well, you know, how, how, how about this? I'll say this, it depends. Uh, if you're per if, if you're purchasing personal insurance, that might work out okay for you if you if you think you know what you're doing. But if you're a business, uh, you need you need to talk to somebody who has experience. Just like uh, you you'd want to talk to your CPA or your attorney or your uh, coach, you know, whomever that might be. You really need to have somebody in place who can help you navigate through the 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 complexity of an insurance policy, because the last thing you want to do is pay a lot of money for insurance and then not have what you need covered, covered. Mm -hmm. True, true. So I'm, I'm going to say with the not, not. Oh, not. I, 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 I had kind of <laughs> surmised that from your answer. So thank you for clarifying that. Uh, I'm going to stick with the internet for a second because uh, I'm going to jump over to Michelle. You know, there's a lot of um, uh, legal type of uh, sites where you can draw up something real quickly and things like that. So hot or not, um, contracts, legal contracts 
uh, via the internet. I can't think of any of the, the sites right now, Rocket Lawyer, things like that. Hot or not, legal contracts via the internet. I gotta say not. <laughs> and the way that I frame this when I'm talking to clients um, for contemplating the alternatives is, are we looking for a transaction? Or are we looking for counsel? Because those things can spit out a piece of paper that does what it purportedly needs to do. But every business situation is different. And so that counsel and the understanding of what it says and why it says what it does and does it do what you need it to do is really the important part of engaging with a lawyer. So if you're going to buy one of those online, you probably still want to have someone look at it. Um, and that may or may not be more cost effective. Right, right. Very true. You just disappointed some people. <laughs> they, but they had it figured out. Uh, I, I see Rocket Lawyer subscriptions being canceled left and right. Sorry, Rocket Lawyer. Uh, <laughs> just joking. Uh, uh, Linda, uh, I, I guess I'm still kind of in a world of the internet and that sort of thing. Um, businesses and marketing, uh, hot or not, spending, I think I know the answer to this, but let's, let's give it a shot. Spending all of the bulk of your dollars on one social media um, or, or, or all in just one media, forget social media, just overall, all of your marketing dollars in one media, hot or not? Oh, definitely not. Mm -hmm. um, be, well, let me say, in most cases, definitely not. Unless you have an extremely, extremely targeted audience and you know exactly where to find them and it's only one place. And that very rarely happens. Uh, most times we see things, we have to see things multiple times, hear them multiple times before we pay attention. And we see it one place, we see it another, we see someone talking about it, maybe on the internet, maybe in social media, maybe there's a blog, etc. And you need all of that to kind of get that repetition and have people be aware of you. And it's never good to put all your eggs in one basket because what happens when that basket drops and all the eggs are broken, right? Um, so I think you want to make sure that you're getting, you're building your brand, you're getting out there. Now, on the other hand, do you want to be in every single medium available? Absolutely not either because uh, you need to go where your customers are, not where you want them to be, but where they are today. And uh, you know, if you wanna be, um, be reaching teenagers, you're not gonna be on Facebook. If you wanna be reaching older adults, you're not probably not gonna be on Instagram. So you need to be sure about that you're in the right place to, rate, to uh, make the right people. But whatever you do, don't, don't just jump into one thing and because that's what you like. It's kind of like the, uh, the old story about the person who loses their, um, their keys and someone comes along, they're looking under the lights, the, uh, you know, the lamp outside. And so why are you looking here? Because that's where the light is. Okay, well, that's where the light is, but you got to go where the people are. You got to <laughs> maybe kind of go out in the dark a little bit and shed some light over there. I agree. I agree. Now, however, I understand not going to Facebook for teenagers or Instagram for older adults. But if you have some mean dance moves, you got to go to TikTok, right? Got to go to TikTok for that. All right. All right. <laughs> um, Phil, we can't leave you out. You know, and, and maybe this is more of a serious uh, concern. A lot of businesses hanging on by, by a string, as we talked about. Uh, hot or not, taking out a second mortgage to keep your business afloat? Ooh, um, scary question. Um, the, the, the purpose of your business is to give you fuel for your personal life. So when you start reverse thrusting those engines, like jets don't go in reverse very well, right? They need a little tractor to push them, but they go like heck in, in the forward direction. Mm -hmm. So that's really scary and, and definitely seek professional advice and definitely call Michelle because you got a lot of rights um to protect as much as uh, of your personal wealth as as possible because if you need to reboot then you want to protect that whereas if you give it all to the bank and and the bank will take it and the bank will ask for it and you don't necessarily have to give it to them just because they're asking so uh scary as heck question and get professional advice and uh definitely not hot all right I figure I hate to bring down the the uh, the mood, but well, that could have been worse him. if you had me doing dance moves on TikTok. It'd be even worse <laughs> than that, so that was the better Fair. of the two. Fair <laughs> enough. Well, you could just find a funny baby and put that on too. I'm going to go back to an individual question because uh, Dan, I don't know if I asked one to you. Um, you know, when you're from the um, the standpoint of, of of insurance and protection and things like that, you know, with people. 
uh, you know, the work from home thing and that sort of thing, it's I got to be a concern for employers. And the question is, how can businesses make sure that they are um, protected when employees are working uh, from home in their home computers? Yeah, you know, that's uh, not only became a, a huge issue in 2020, it's going to continue to be forever. I don't think that that's changed. And in fact, I think you're, you're finding more and more employers who want that to happen. And, and unfortunately, it's not quite as simple as saying, hey, go work from home. Uh, from, a, from a cyber crime protection, and this is really important, uh, from a cyber crime protection, the employer needs to make sure that they have a cyber insurance policy that has bring your called something called bring your own device, not bring your own bottle, but bring your own device. Uh, <laughs> because if I'm working for you, James, and I'm, I'm at home and I'm working off my own computer and uh, somebody next door is, is uh, unscrupulous and, and comes in there and, and uh, does some, some chaos you know, if I'm using my computer, your, your cyber policy may not cover that. And so it's very important that uh, the cyber protection that you have, first of all, I got to buy cyber insurance for that. You got to get uh, bring your own device. Then I'm going to say, uh, talk to Michelle Baumberger, because legally you want to make sure that everything that is being done under the veil of, of the corporation legally is, is being taken care of. Uh, then finally, this is, I think this gets overlooked. Uh, when people are working from home, uh, I think the, the old theory was, well, uh, they're probably out walking the dog and doing their laundry and watching soap operas or doing something like that. They're not working hard. The, the opposite is actually the case. And research has shown that people are overworked uh, working from home. And so you got to have to, you're going to have to find a way to, 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 to be helping your, your uh, employees not be overworked, to collaborate more, to have some fun, to do some things that are gonna bring the team together and, and make it not such a mental drain working from home. So uh, those are three things that I think that all employers who have uh, employees working virtually uh, should be considering. That's good, good, good advice. So I'm going to mix it up here. We're going to go back to a group question. And since we're kind of talking about working at home and that sort of thing, I think this, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this particular question. So, you know, with the increase in re remote working and Zoom calls and things like that, you know, things that may have been taboo before, you know, a child running into the room or dog barking at squirrels outside and that sort of thing. Um, it, a lot of people don't see it as a, a faux pas as much anymore. You know, when will we see a return to a more, or will we, a more business-like structure? Um, uh, or will we see a return in, in more business, a more business-like structure in 2022 when you think of all those things we've gotten used to and, quite frankly, learned to overlook? Um, Linda, let's go to you. What are your thoughts on that? You know, it's interesting because I, I'm not sure that we're ever going back to normal the way it was before. Um, not in 2022, not maybe after that. I think some things are never going to come back. Um, I, if I was selling um, really um, formal dress wear for, not formal for a, a wedding or a ball, but formal to go to, to work, if I was selling suits and dresses, I think I'd be in a little bit nervous because mm -hmm. I don't know that we're going to go back to that level of formality. Um, I don't know that people are going to be wearing three inch heels to walk around in and those types of things. Um, I do see that there are organizations where you see a little more sense of, uh, you know, we don't want to see your kid in the background and it's okay if the dog barks, but please try not to. So I do see that there's becoming more of a sense of formality. And I think what as we move to the hybrid organization, which I think is what we're going to see in, in 2022, we're going to see where you have an interaction between a group of people sitting on a, a Zoom call like this and people sitting in the office. And to be taken seriously, the people who are on the remote end are going to have to look like they belong in the office, even though they can have their sneakers on and, you know, and sweatpants on where we don't see them. Hopefully they're wearing pants. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think that's what's going to happen is you're going to see this um, as we move to hybrid, you're going to see more of a need to um, to have the people in the office relax a little and the people at home be a little bit more um, a little bit more dressed up in the sense of coming to work. Right, right. Business up top, party down below. Right. <laughs> uh, 
uh, Michelle, you know, one thing that I'll, I'll throw it over to you to get your, your thoughts. And whenever I think about this type of question, I think from a legal standpoint, I can't help but uh, think of the, what I think was the best meme of 2020, uh, the guy who had the cat face on. It's like, your honor, it's me. I'm not a cat, really, you know. And so I, I'm curious to hear your thoughts with the spin of, you know, some of the some of the the, the, the the legal type meetings and things such as that, I mean, the formality or, you know, is, is there a, an angle that you throw in when it comes to will we see a return uh, in 2022 of, of some of that particular business like formal like structure? You know, I think there's there's a sense of not going back. We've come this far and things that don't require an in-person hearing, in-person you know, everyone shows up, sits down, raises their right hand, you know, and again, I'm not a litigator, so I don't do a lot of that, but just from sort of the administrative hearing standpoint, things that used to be done, you know, consistently via, via phone will probably can continue that way. But now you've got this blend to, well, there's not a need to get everybody in a car and show up at a place. Um, and so I think that will probably remain in, in some spaces. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we've seen just in our, in our own business is, the shift from what would have normally been a, just a plain phone call to a Zoom environment, which I actually think will stay from the connection that it provides. You know, you, you get just a little bit more of that interpersonal connection, especially in an initial phone call or consultation mm -hmm. by being able to see the person, get a little bit of that body language, get a little bit of a feel. And then I think on the ongoing relationship part, we'll see it shift maybe back to no video. Like at this point, we just default everything to either Zoom or Teams. And if someone doesn't want to turn on video, that's totally fine um, from, a, from a client relationship standpoint. So I think that there's actually some benefit there um, to, to having this option um, to create engagement with people. Um, but I would reiterate Linda's point. The first thing I went to was every day I look at the heels that I pulled out of the box and I am not putting them on. Nope. <laughs> I, I have I have brought up the slacks from the jeans, but I have not done the heels yet. The heels. Yep. <laughs> so not only are formal you know, suit dress uh, retailers, they have something to worry about, dry cleaners, and now podiatrists. Doggone it. <laughs> <laughs> what on earth are they going to do? Uh, Phil, throw your thoughts in if you would. Uh, yeah, you bet. I've had a home office for about 27 years. And then when other people had to work from home down, now there's traffic. So that was a bit of a pain. Um, but fortunately, most of those are, are back. So I agree with the others. Definitely, we're in it for uh, a hybrid model. And uh, fortunately, my hobby was photography. So I had all this great gear. And now I was able to see, say to my wife, see, like I need all this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so it's now tax deductible. So that was definitely a, a bonus. And then to, to Linda's point, the people working at home need to look like they've got a professional environment, they need some decent lighting and ideally a microphone because if you're speaking, especially in a sales situation, James, so more relevant for you, if you want to sound like you're in the inside of a garbage can or um, like you, some kid shining a flashlight on you or something, that's not going to bode well for still visual first impressions and our subconscious evaluating people that, that we're dealing with. So we definitely need to be as professional as we can in our environments. It, it's here to stay. Uh, I've got coaching clients down the street and around the world that I've never met in person. And so the, the technology has been there for a while and, and uh, COVID hasn't actually changed that. And, and so definitely it's here to stay and again, get good at it because uh, resisting it isn't, isn't a good strategy. Right, right. So Dan, I'm gonna change up um, the, the, Good, because I was going to say exactly what Phil said. So I, I, I was just going to say what what Phil said. So right, right, <laughs> yeah. So I mean, individual question. I don't know why this just popped in my mind, but you know, given the different landscape and and, and insurance, and you know, the actuaries get together and they crank out probabilities of you know things you're being exposed to, what your lifestyle is like, and things such as that. I got to imagine that, or, or I wonder you know, is going forward, is it going to change, you know, uh, the insurance landscape, whether it be, you know, health, I don't know if people are staying home, sitting around more, 
uh, or maybe have a more time to exercise when they're supposed to be at work. I don't know. I, I'm curious, is that in any way the landscape of insurance, do you anticipate maybe going for it, changing, uh, uh, you know, altering in any kind of fashion, given the new environment that likely is going to result and has resulted? Well, it's already started changing. I'm, I, I don't do health insurance. And so I, I, I'm not an expert on, on that. I, I, I well, you do long-term I, care, you know, so. Yeah. You know long, so I, what I will talk about are things I, I know. So long-term care. Yeah. The long-term care, the life insurance in, in a whole, it's interesting. Um, you know, you saw some, some things saying that due to COVID uh, uh, you know, the mortality went down, but that's mortality at birth. Uh, mm -hmm. The reality is, is people are, are, um, are going to be gauged on on how healthy they are, and if 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 you're you're spending more time being healthy, uh, then your 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 rates are ultimately going to go down. But from a business standpoint, let me talk about that uh, because mm -hmm. we we have seen some significant changes due to what COVID did, and and that's sending people virtually. We've seen an increase in pricing on employment practices liability. That's when, when uh, employers are being sued by their employees. In other words, there's more of that going on. Uh, we are seeing an increase in cyber premiums because guess what? There's more ransomware attacks going on. And so insurance is in flux and we're, we're starting to see that now as we're about a year and a half into this. So from a business owner's perspective, they need to be aware of those things that um, are causing higher rates and making changes in their own organization that will keep their, you know, keep their insurance premiums lower because they're, they're doing the right things. Example, one example really quickly is multi-factor authentication on, on, your, on, on cyber. You know, if, if you don't have it, you may not even be able to get insurance. So those are some things that we're starting to see uh, on the insurance landscape. Very interesting. So it, it remains to be seen what the, you know, what will change and uh, and exactly what what it will cost or how it will benefit us. Well, you know, they say time flies when you're having fun, and you know, I look at the clock, and my goodness, we are up against. Uh, the end of the show here. So I'm going to thank all of uh, my co-hosts for joining for this uh, conversation. Hopefully everybody heard something that they can take away and maybe act on or, or ponder a bit. Uh, I will ask uh, or remind everyone to uh, follow us or follow us on our social media pages, uh, YouTube, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and you can catch the podcast anywhere where you get podcasts, whether it be um, Apple or Stitcher or Spotify or the other 50, I have no idea, exist. Uh, somewhere out there, we are, as Dan says, ubiquitous. Uh, so make sure to, to, <laughs> to uh, lock it in and listen each week to The Shrimp Tank. And uh, for uh, a replay of this particular episode, you can go to shrimptankpodcast.com slash Seattle. With that, I'm going to relinquish my uh, my uh, host hat, send it over to Dan to take us out. Well, James, we're going to all give you the golf clap. Uh, that was that was uh, fantastic. We're all going to give the, the golf clap to James. Well done. And Dan's uh, hands. I like that. Okay. <laughs> and some jazz hands, too. Well done. So listen, we're going to be back next Wednesday. Phil Simchich, I think you're uh, you're, you're, you've uh, flip-flopped with Linda because of a commitment. And, and so Phil's going to be with me next week. We're going to die. And that's October 6th, 12 p.m. We're back on our normal time, 12 p.m., October 6th. We're going to dive into the world of CBD with Amy Maddox of Mad Ritual. So please join us then. But in the meantime, please be safe, be well, be prosperous. Because until next week, the shrimp is back in the tank. So long. I've been feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp.